28 degrees. But uh, be sure and keep submitting questions. This is a good way to learn, good way to study. Here's an interesting question. Songs uh, number 280 and 419, both in their final verses, mention faith being replaced by heavenly sight. Is this a biblical concept? When we finally see Jesus, will we no longer have faith? Is, a, is faith a leap in the dark, not knowing that there is a God, but blindly believing in a God which we have never seen? What is faith as the Bible speaks of it? Now, this is a lot more involved than you may think. Let's run a few references here and see if we can come to a conclusion. It may be a case of semantics, of the way we use words, and it also may involve the different ways that faith is used in the Bible. Uh, one of the great ways, not the major way, but uh, that faith is used is a synonym for trust. And there'll never be a time that we will be without trust in God. But, for instance, uh, faith is the substance of, of things uh, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So when you couple those verses together, uh, there is a sense in which when we do see that our need for the faith that's defined in those passages will be gone. Uh, Hebrews ten thirty nine, We're not of them that draw back to perdition, but of those who believe unto the saving of the soul. We believe unto the saving of the soul. I believe 1 Peter 1, 9 has a lot of commentary on this point. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So in regard to uh, faith, uh, we walk with faith and not by sight, and the end of your faith, and the definition of faith in Hebrews 11, 1, I'd say that those songs are not unscriptural. Now, we never know what the songwriter means, and that really isn't the point. It's what the words say, and can we get scriptural meaning out of them? I have no way of knowing what the songwriter meant when they used the words, faith will be lost in heavenly sight. But now, if you use faith in the sense of trust, like Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths, there'll never be a time when trust in God will be out of style. Uh, I think of the time when Doubting Thomas said, I'll not believe until I've seen the, uh, his ribbon side and the nail prints in his hands and feet. And when he did see, he said, my Lord and my God, John twenty twenty eight. But Jesus immediately said, you're blessed because you've seen more blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. So there is a sense in, what the, in which the Bible looks forward to a time that faith will be lost in heavenly sight. But it would seem to me that once we see the fruition, culmination, fulfillment of all our hopes and dreams and aspiration, we'll trust in him even more. I mean, everything he promised came to pass. Uh, really, there's not a lot of difference in faith and hope in this regard. And Romans 8 says we don't hope for that which we see. And uh, Hebrews 6, uh, beginning with verse 11 and going to the end of the chapter, speaks of we have hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, that we will enter into the Holy of Holies heaven itself, where Christ our forerunner is already gone. So there'll be a lot of things that we hope for and had faith in and look forward to that will be lost in heavenly sight. And so I think it's just a matter of the difference, the way the word faith is used in the Bible, but the predominating way it's used is in view of anticipation, looking forward to and Again, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, when we see, then we have the evidence. But I believe the only way I know to answer this, in fairness to all these texts, is that we'll never, there'll never be a time when loyal, trusting adherence to God will be removed. It could even grow. But as far as the faith that uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and Hebrews 10, 39, and 1 Peter 1, 6 to 9 mentions, I think that's another matter. Uh, if God the Father sent Jesus his Son to save mankind, was he not questioning the Father when he cried before his death under Mark fifteen thirty four, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Please explain. Actually, uh, the best way to explain it is 2 Corinthians five twenty one. In 2 Corinthians five twenty one, we read that God made Christ to be sin for us, even though he knew no sin. 
he, Jehovah, laid the iniquity of us all upon him, Isaiah 53. But sin separates a man from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And so if the Father's plan came to fruition, that his Son would leave heaven and come to earth and suffer and bleed and die and become obedient even unto the death of the cross, Philippians 2, 8, and be counted not as a sinner, but sin bearer, sin offering, sin substitute, though he knew no sin, then that separation would have to come if God were consistent with his word. Jesus was not a sinner, but he represented all the sinners ever lived. 1 Peter 2, 24 says he bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. Actually, though, and a lot of people don't understand, Jesus was simply quoting verbatim Psalm 22 when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if you read Psalm 22 when you go home tonight, you'll find that 1,000 years before Golgotha, before Calvary, the place of the skull where Jesus died, the prophecy was made that he would die and that men would look upon his back that they had beaten and in derision at the down on the ground they would mock him. So really this is fulfillment of Scripture, and Jesus is quoting Scripture. And there's one other verse that we've used before that I still think is substantive, substantive whatever the word is. It's a good one. Uh, Habakkuk 1.13. I'm going to have to work on the dictionary this week. I try to get one big new word each time, and I hadn't gotten there yet. But in Habakkuk 1.13, we read that God is of purer eyes than to look upon sin. Now Jesus was not a sinner, but he represented sin. And since God is of pure eyes than to look upon sin, he had to look away from the Son to look at you as me and, to you and me as sinners that we might be redeemed. And so Jesus now, fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 22, quotes Psalm 22 to put the focus on what is happening there. Now some have gone so far as to say Jesus became a sinner and even that he went to hell and uh, came back, you know. But the Bible teaches no such thing. He was alienated because of our sins from the Father for a moment to show, number one, how much God loves us, how much Christ was willing to sacrifice for us, how shameful sin is. And that's another reason that only Christ could be the one mediator between God and men because only he absolutely identified with deity and humanity perfectly. I believe that the, this is a very deep question, really, but it involves more, more than anything else how much heaven loves us. Turn to Romans 2.14, please. Does Romans 2.14 apply to us today? I've never had that exact question. I've discussed Romans 2 uh, beginning with about verse 6 and going through 16, but I've never had this exact question asked point blank. Does Romans 2.14 apply to anyone today? If so, to whom? Just reading it, lifting it out of context. <clears throat> For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. Number one, that does not have direct application to anybody today because the gospel of Christ has come, and on the day of Pentecost, officially, the old covenant was removed, and the distinction, the middle wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentiles was forever removed. Ephesians 2, 11 through 14. Someone has said the only barrier God ever allowed to separate men was the Ten Commandments, the law of commandments contained in ordinances that separate Jew and Greek. And when Jesus died on the cross, he forever removed that and will be the person that ever erects another barrier. The reason I do not believe it applies to anybody today is that all men are amenable to the gospel today. Christ has power over all flesh, John 17, 2. And all men everywhere must repent, Acts 17.30, and everybody will be judged by the gospel of Christ one day, Romans 2.16, not by the law of Moses and the patriarchal and whatever else men might invent. But we're going to all be judged by the gospel of Christ, and Jesus said, by the words I have spoken unto you, John 12.48. But the context is so important here. I don't believe there's a place in the Bible where the context is as important as right here in Romans 2. I listen very carefully, and I, if you've been reading Romans lately, you'll know this is so. If you'll go home tonight and search the Scripture, see if it's so, you'll say it is so, because it is so. This is one thing I'm teaching that I know is so, because the Bible's so clear on it. But obey Acts 17, 11 and search the Scriptures. In Romans chapter 1, after stating that the gospel is a system of faith that must be obeyed by all nations, 
That's Romans 1, 5. It then goes to Romans 1, 16 and says, The gospel of Christ is God's power to save everyone, both Jew and Greek, for in it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the just shall live by faith. And so after that, in verse 18 of chapter 1, through the end of the chapter, he turns and rebukes the sins of the Gentiles, the pagan, the heathen of the first century, the non-Jew, prior to the gospel. In Romans 2, though, he turns immediately to the Jewish element in the church of Rome and says, you're inexcusable because you're guilty of committing the same sins you look down your noses at and rebuke the Gentiles for. And now he makes this statement followed two verses later by saying, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So whatever 2.14 ever did mean, and whatever its application may have been, I know what all men everywhere are under today who are accountable to God. And when I say those who are accountable to God, I'm saying little babies and uh, crazy people without a mind and so forth that, that cannot... Uh, be condemned because they haven't made a decision to reject Christ. Uh, they either they don't have the mental capacity or they're not of age to do it. But the gospel of Christ is God's standard of authority. And that's what we'd be judged by someday. For instance, in Romans 7, he'll say, we're dead to the law, and he quotes the law we're dead to, the law that said thou shalt not covet. And that's the law that says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and that's the law that's the Ten Commandment law. He said we're dead to that law, that we should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we're dead to the law of Moses, and we are spiritually alert to Jesus Christ and his gospel. Now, what did this mean in the setting? For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, if you'll continue to read all the way through this book, after stating in chapter 1, verse 5, that the gospel is a system of faith that must be obeyed by all nations, when it comes to the last chapter, 16, in verse 26, he makes the same statement again. That this gospel was once a mystery, once hidden, now it's revealed. And what is it? It's the gospel which must be obeyed by all nations. But what did it mean in the setting? The Jews said to the Gentiles, Acts 15, verse 1, except you follow the Ten Commandments and become circumcised, you cannot be saved. He said, that won't work. And that was the conclusion at the discussion of Jerusalem, that the gospel of Christ applied to all. But prior to the Christianity's establishment, the gospel's revealing in Acts 2, there was the patriarchal system that the Gentiles continued under from creation to the cross. And parenthetically, 1,500 years before the cross, the law of Moses, the law of God given through Moses, the Ten Commandment law was for the Jews. So they stepped out of the patriarchal system and got under the mosaical institution, if you please, authored by God. But the patriarchal system, and that's what he's talking about here in Romans 14, continued until the cross for the Gentiles. And at the end of this chapter, he'll say, and I'll tell you another thing, a man is not a Jew who is just one outwardly. Just because you were born physically a Jew doesn't mean anything anymore. You've got to be born again to enter the kingdom. John 3, 1, 7. So I would answer, first of all, that Romans 2.14 does not apply to anybody today. He's simply saying that you're trying to get the Gentiles to follow the law of Moses, but every essential ingredient that was in the Ten Commandments that made a man righteous was embedded in the patriarchal system anyway. It's always been wrong to commit adultery and lie and steal and covet. Those are principles that always abide, and those principles still abide in Christianity. These are principles of holiness and righteousness that God has never uh, annulled or abrogated. They continue. Nine of the Ten Commandments were not brought over into New Testament Christianity. The principles of God have always been from creation till the judgment day. And they've been embedded in every system we ever had for anybody and everybody. But we're under something deeper than the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments said, don't commit adultery. Christianity says, don't look on a woman to lust after it's not only wrong to uh, uh, speak against a neighbor, it's wrong to speak against anybody because in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we learn that every man on earth that has need is our neighbor. So Christianity extends, enlarges, deepens, enriches, refines, purifies, Screen brings recording. it to a loftier now. level. Screen recording. Screen but recording the basic video principles have never ceased and they never will because God is pure and holy and he says, be holy as I'm holy. 
Leviticus 17 and uh, Leviticus 4, uh, 11, 44 and 1 Peter 1, 16. I think that's a good question, a thought provoker. <laughs> Why does the church of Christ deny people can join the church? Did you know we have some brethren today who think we make much ado over nothing there and they believe it's hard to say that. And they go to Acts chapter 9 that says uh, when the apostle Paul came to a certain area, he joined himself to the disciples. Now, if you use it in that sense and explain what you're talking about, it wouldn't be unscriptural. But the idea of an alien sinner joining the church is unheard of in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2 says those who gladly received the word were baptized and the Lord added them to the church. So you can join the Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club and the Rotary Club and the Garden Club and a whole lot of things like that, but Christianity is on a higher level and it's something human hands never touch. It's one thing to make yourself known to brethren when you go to a place on a vacation or move there to work, to live. You're already in the body of Christ. You didn't join the church of the Lord. You were added to that by the Lord himself. Human hands didn't touch it. I remember hearing the story years ago of a man who went to a testifying meeting, a Pentecostal meeting, and uh, after everybody else had testified, he jumped up and told the biggest whopper of them all. He said, well, I was out milking a cow tonight, an angel of the Lord came right down there in that barn where I was and got me down on the ground and wrestled me, and I whooped him. And uh, they jumped up and said, let's vote him in, and they unanimously voted him in. What a testimony. On the way home, his wife said, you're the biggest liar in seven counties. Said, an angel of the Lord wouldn't get that close to you anyway, and you couldn't whip him if he did. And said, you're going back tomorrow night to tell the truth. So he stood up the next night and said, I lied last night. And so they voted him out. On the way home, he said, that's the strangest church I ever saw. Told a lie and they voted me in. Told the truth and they voted me out. We need to understand that the church of our Lord is a divine entity. And that when we obey the Lord, he adds, 1 Corinthians 3 says, God gives the increase. He's in charge of the old book. But we should make ourselves known <laughs> to other brethren. What does the Bible teach regarding separation of church and state? Well, unfortunately, the Bible was written a good long while before the United States of America. That's why it always aggravates me when brethren take the book of Revelation written to people at the end of the first century concerning things that would shortly come to pass dealing with their immediate problems and people think it only began to be fulfilled when Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement came and brought the church out of the wilderness that had been there 1,260 years. That would be a lot of comfort to the seven congregations of Asia at the end of the first century intensely persecuted by the Roman authorities to know that centuries and centuries later the United States of America uh, with eagle on its money, and that proves that he's got to be talking about the United States when the eagle flew out there in chapter 12, on and on and on it goes. Uh, it's beyond ridiculous. So I doubt that we're going to find a whole lot in the Bible about what the United States people talk about separation of church and state. We have a phobia that the only type of government that's worth anything is a democracy within a republic. Or is it a republic within a democracy? I never get that quite right. I believe I can go to heaven and miss it. But uh, we say that's the only form of government God ordained. Well, that's strange. His government's a divine monarchy. I believe a monarchy would be the best form of government if the monarch was perfect. Christ's kingdom is a monarchy, not a democracy. Some of my brethren think that the church ought to be run like a democracy or a labor union where people strive and struggle and fight and fuss and get the ascendancy of power and might makes right. And up in Detroit, Michigan, where a lot of Southerners moved many, many years ago to work in the automobile factories, uh, a lot of congregations, once they got into this union concept of, of uh, the plants where they work, they tried to bring that into the church of the Lord and just overlook elders and what the Bible says about the oversight of elders and just run it like a, another labor union. What does the Bible say about separation of church and state? Well, first of all, if you're talking about the church of the Lord, it's unique. It's one of a kind. It's in a category all its own. And probably the prompting line is Acts 5, 29. When any government or any form of government or anybody in government tells the church to do anything foreign to God's will, we just have to say, well, to obey God rather than men. Now, usually when a question like this is asked, we soon get into, should we have prayer in public school? I know some of you are not going to like what I'm about to say. 
But I don't believe the public school is the place to teach the Bible and teach people how to pray. I believe the Lord left that in the hands of parents and his church. And we do greatly err when we try to make public schools a satellite of New Testament Christianity. It'll never work because the very moment a divine premise of morality is taught, the public schools will have a wall-eyed fit. We've got to understand there is a role and a function for New Testament Christianity, and if we depend on anybody to train our children to serve God, we've missed the whole point. We're not of this world, John 15, 19. In fact, I'd give anything in the world if, if the school would just educate children honestly. Now, I'm talking about uh, evolution and that sort of thing is not honest. It's not intelligent. It's not right. It's contrary to the Bible. But I wish they'd throw out all the December 25th deal that occupies the last three weeks of December in the school system. Uh, to me, that is really a misuse of educational time. And anything that's spiritually right, the church of the Lord ought to be doing anyway. But uh, what does the Bible say about separation of church and state? It just says the New Testament church is a unique, one of a kind, nothing else like it in the whole wide world. And we need to appreciate that. I tell you this, the public schools, and I, I major in secondary education, minor in history, and I've taught school across the country a lot of times, but I'm telling you right now that public schools of America have become so humanistic and so undisciplined, it's a tragedy. But you want another thing that's a tragedy? Schools that claim to be Christian schools that are just about like the public schools. And I'm not your enemy when I tell you the truth. I'd love to find a Christian school. I wish there were one somewhere. I'd hug it around the neck. But too many times, he who pays the fiddler pipes a tune. Pepperdine College is a good illustration. Started by a great New Testament Christian, George Pepperdine, founder of Western Auto Stores. Great dream of his on the West Coast to have such. Now nearly all the boards made up of Hollywood uh, motion picture stars and are their wives or kinfolks or big industry. And now about uh, 30 percent of the students are members of the church. They have all kinds of immorality and worldliness on that campus every day. If that's a Christian college, I'm a Methodist bishop. And I'm just telling the truth. But old George Pepperdine started it with noble intentions in mind. Why do we have to take people's money for a certain thing and then evolutionize it in, I'm talking about in the natural occurrences of the world, to where we just get more and more like that, which we fought against to establish it in the first place? Have some real, some more good questions here. Please turn to Luke 21, 24. Now, this is one that we're going to have to do lots of thinking about. Luke 21, 24. Well, first of all, again, whatever the government tells the church is not what the church does. The question was, what does the Bible say about separation of church and state? That was our question. But uh, I'd say this. It'd be very, very difficult for a faithful New Testament Christian to enter the mainstream of the world anywhere the way the world is going and not either be booted out or compromised, it'd take a very, very strong character to stand up. I don't mean it can't be done. But we just live in a world that is oriented toward uh, Satan's end of the affairs, uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world. But we're not impugning the motives of an individual Christian our influence, though, is not going to be through government and through education as much as just by living the Christian life every day. One reason I don't sign petitions and things like that, whatever a current issue may be, is I believe a Christian living and teaching every day the way he should will over the long haul influence the world for righteousness better in that area anyway, where he isn't compromised or where it isn't watered down. But well, every Christian should be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we are whether the world knows it or not. So again, the question was, what does the Bible say about that? Not what men say to the church, but what does the Bible say? 
Please explain Luke 21, 24, where the phrase times of the Gentiles are fulfilled is found. Now, you recognize Luke 21 is parallel to Matthew 24 and Mark 13, the discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's notice verse uh, 24 and uh, 25. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles. And that is when the Roman government in the year 70 AD did what he's talking about here. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now again, verse 25, whether you're aware of it or not, is a direct quote or application of many Old Testament references and even a statement in Acts chapter 2 that always without exception meant the end of one system and the beginning of another. In uh, Isaiah 13 and 14, when Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon was going to fall and another government was to take over the Medo-Persians, it's likened to the same thing, the sun, the moon, the stars falling out of orbit, that which seems so certain and definite no longer being so. And he said... That's the way it's going to be when Jerusalem is destroyed. This great seat of Jewish hierarchy is going to go up in smoke. In Acts chapter 2, as he discusses the day of Pentecost, he uses the same language, meaning the end of Judaism and the beginning of Christianity. But the phrase again is, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Uh, turn to me, uh, with me to Romans chapter 11. I believe we have a Bible commentary on this. In Romans 11... Verse 11 and 12 first. I say then, if they stumble, that they should fall, meaning the Jews who were in the olive tree and then branches, natural branches cut off. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, when the Gentiles are saved, the Jews on the outside looking in can't stand that for the Gentiles to be elevated above them in the realm of redemption. So it'll provoke them to proper jealousy to bring them back. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now, let's turn to verse 25 of the same chapter, Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, let's put all that together. I believe he's simply saying that the Jewish nation is going to go down just like the uh, Babylonians did, just like Jerusalem did, just like Judaism did. And the Gentiles that have been in the background all this time while the Jews were God's chosen people will be elevated and it will make the Jews jealous after a godly fashion. Second Corinthians 11 verse 2, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. And it'll cause them to come back in. But before they do, the Gentiles are going to have a full opportunity to be saved. I believe the fullness of the Gentiles come in is explained here in Romans 11. That Luke 21, 24, and 25 is explained in Romans 11, verses 11 and 12, and 11 and 25. In other words, the Gentiles are going to have a full opportunity. The gospel is going to be presented to them. What did uh, Jesus say in Luke 4? I turned to the Gentiles. What did Paul say in Acts 13 and Acts 28? Lo, I turned to the Gentiles. So he simply, when he uses that expression, he's saying the Gentiles are under the heading of the Roman army and the Roman government are going to destroy Jerusalem. And the Gentiles are going to hold sway. And they're going to have opportunity to be redeemed. Full opportunity. Think about that and we'll talk about it later. I, I might mention one other thing too. In Colossians 1, 6 and 23, Paul said all creation under heaven has heard the gospel preached. The Roman Empire has heard the gospel preached. She had to get Judaism out of there. And then all roads led to Rome. The fullness of the Gentiles. They had a full opportunity. Does that mean the Jews had no opportunity? No. If they come back, they'll be grafted back in. They're the natural branches. Greetings, everyone. I'm selected. Accessibility. Announce note. Select. Sound recognition. Code scan. Apple TV. Camera. Flat. Wallet. Timer. Notes. Hearing device. Music recognition. Button. Selected. Screen record.